We lift it up to you this morning as an offering. Father, use us as you see fit. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you've been saved, aren't you glad the chains are gone? And that God's amazing grace has set us free? And uh, think about the sacrifice that He made. You know, today is, is one of those days in the lives of churches that, that begins what we call Passion Week. It begins that look at the last week of Christ's life. And that triumphal entry, when He makes this entry into uh, Jerusalem, and then all of the events that will take place that will lead up to um, one of the most solemn days of all history, His crucifixion. The day in which He suffered beyond description. And you can, you can turn, and I want to encourage you to, to spend this week and that you would read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you would spend some time in that last week of Christ's life reading the Scripture and trying to get uh, your mind set on the fact of what Christ did for you. Just, just stop right there. Don't, don't, don't jump to the point of what He did for, for that person down the street or for this person. Think about what He did for you. Because I believe when we really let what He did for us get a hold of us, We'll, we'll go and we'll be concerned about the people down the street. We'll be concerned about the, the empty pews around us. But, but it, it, won't, it won't happen until we fully grasp what Christ did for us and His sacrifice. So read that. A third of those Gospels all talk about that last week of His life. And then when you get into... They, they, they can't even begin to give you a description of the suffering that Christ went through. Words just aren't there. Pictures are not even able to be given that, that would really depict what Christ went through for us. If you want to find in your Bibles Hebrews chapter 9, we'll get there in just a moment. But I want us to think about the sacrifice that Christ offered and how His sacrifice was different than every other sacrifice that had ever been or ever would be offered. Last week I tried to define sacrifice, and so I want to share that again with you. It's this picture of or this idea that we give away or that we give up something that is of value or importance to us. And we give it up and we give it to God or we give it to someone or we give it up for those individuals. For us, it's that act of offering to God something that is precious or special to us. So I have a question for you. What's the most important thing in your life? What's the most important thing in your life? What's the most valuable thing to you that, that you would say is valuable or important to you? It might be something or it might be someone. What is it? The truth of the matter is, for many of us, the things that we mark as important are not as important as we think they are. So let me ask it this way. What would you give up for your family? What would you give up for your friends? What would you give up for a stranger? What would you give up for the Lord? Well, I'd do this for my family, and I'd do this for the Lord, but that stranger can just fend for themselves. And, and, and I'll tell you the difference. I'll tell you what, what motivates us to, to consider giving up or act, actually acting on giving up what is important to us. And it's the relationship that we have with the individual. The relationship that I have with my family, with my friend, is the reason that I would sacrifice or I would give up something for them. The Old Testament 
full of descriptions and pictures of sacrifices. Animals. Grain offerings. All different types of sacrifices that would be made. That would be made over... Hear hear this. They are made over and over again. They're done for the purpose of putting people into the right position with the Lord. And it's good for a time, and then they're going to have to come and offer that sacrifice again. They're going to have to go get another bull, another goat, another lamb. They're going to have to go get another animal. They're going to have to go through this process again and again. All in an effort to be in a right standing or a right position with the Lord. And then there's pictures of sacrifices in the Scripture that would show us that folks are willing to give up what is important to them what is valuable to them for the purpose of doing and being obedient to the Lord. Think with me for just a minute. Genesis chapter 2, 22 rather, speaks to us about a fellow by the name of Abraham. It's a story that many of us know. Abraham and Sarah were of old age and weren't able to have children, and yet God promised that they would have a child, and that from that child, they they would be the father of generations. So, So large and so vast that you couldn't even count the number of them. I mean, that's that's the promise that Abraham received. He's Abram, and he receives this promise. And God provides for them a son by the name of Isaac. And it is through that son that this seed of all the people would come from. That these generations to come that would be his family would stem from that. And he watches Isaac grow up, and looks at him and loves him with every ounce of being, just like we love our kids, even though they... They sometimes get on our nerves and they do things that maybe aren't so lovable. Doesn't mean we stop loving them. They had that relationship. And then came the day that God spoke to Abraham and said, Hey, I want you to take your son and I want you to gather up some firewood and I I want you to go to a place, Mount Moriah, I want you to offer a sacrifice there. And Abraham, agonizing over the love for his son and his love and desire to be obedient to the Lord, doesn't go talk to Sarah and tell her what he's getting ready to do. We don't have that recorded. Because every mama would have tried to talk their husband out of doing that. Abraham gets a couple of servants. They get their horses together. They get the firewood. They get the pot. They get everything that they would need for this sacrifice. Except for the lamb or the animal. And so you have to wonder as they're leaving, that the servants might be wondering in their minds, where we've got everything, but where's, where's the animal for this sacrifice? You know, Abraham's getting a little old. Maybe he forgot this post, didn't put this on his post-it note to remind him. But they didn't say anything. Isaac's maybe wondering the same thing, and, and he doesn't really say anything. And Probably some of the family's wondering, hey, what's, you're going. They leave, and they go on a three-day journey. And you know the story. They unload all the stuff off the animals. and Abraham tells his servants to stay here, that he and Isaac are going up to offer a sacrifice. He says, we're going to go worship. There's a little phrase in there that says, and we will return. Jason's translation or my... We will return. 
one way or the other, he was bringing his son back with him. But he goes up on there, and then at some point, Isaac has to realize, probably that moment when his dad takes him after they've made this bed and this altar, and he begins to lay him there and tie him to be that sacrifice. What's most important to you? What would you give up for your family and for your friends? Oh, preacher, this is tough. Yes, it would be. But Abraham, in a desire to be obedient to the Lord and putting his full faith and trust in the Lord, puts his son this promised son that would be the seed for the generations to come would places him on the altar. Pulls up the knife, the axe that it was going to, and as he comes back and as he's getting ready to come down, an angel comes. Abraham, Abraham. Stops him. Abraham looks and over in the thicket, over there in some rough stuff, is a ram that's got his horns caught up in there. And God, in response to Abraham's obedience and willingness to give up what was most important to him, what was of most value to him, to make a sacrifice beyond what you and I could, could even fathom, God provides a ram. God provides an animal sacrifice. And they, they then go through that process. They return home and the story moves on from there. But there's a picture of someone that is willing to give up what is most important to them. Something of value and significance for the purpose of being obedient to the Lord. And, and the real truth is, all of those other sacrifices, when they, would, when they would take an animal and they would shed its blood and then they would pour some of that blood on the altar and they would offer those sacrifices, it was all in an effort to be obedient to the law, to be obedient to the teaching that they were receiving. In order for you to receive forgiveness of sin, you must do this. In order to, for this to happen, you must do this. And they were just in the process, the people, of doing exactly what they needed to do to stay in a right position and be obedient to the Lord. And there were a couple of pictures of those sacrifices that I think are important. One of those would be this, this uh, sacrifice that would have been made, and I think it's Exodus chapter 12, uh, it speaks of it in there. It's during the plagues, and there was the, uh, it was the very last plague, and it was the plague of the firstborn, that they were going to kill the firstborn. It's where the Passover was instituted. When you read the gospel accounts and you read about Jesus getting the meal prepared for the Passover, they're coming to Jerusalem to observe this Passover that portrays and goes back to this moment in which they would prepare a, a lamb without blemish, an animal without blemish, and they would shed its blood and they would put its blood over the doorpost of their home in Exodus. And by doing so, it when the Lord passed over to take the life of all of those Egyptians, firstborn, He would pass over those homes and spare the lives of the people that were inside. And the Scripture says, do, do this Passover regularly, annually, as a reminder of what Christ, what God did for you then. But there was something that had to be done over and over and over again. But it was a blood sacrifice for the protection of people. And so we see this sacrifice of a lamb. And then there was one day a year. It's called the Day of Atonement. And in that Day of Atonement, the high priest, after doing all that he could to consecrate himself and to make sure that he was right with the Lord. He would take a blood sacrifice and he would go into what is called the Holy of Holies. As you read those accounts in the 
in the Gospels, you'll hear about that. Because there's an event that happens when Christ dies on the cross and the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. This veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And only one day a year and only one person, the high priest, could enter that room. And on that day, he would offer a sacrifice there for the nation of Israel. For all of their sins of what we might call sins, sins of ignorance, anything that hadn't been covered by any other sacrifice and, and offering that would have been made, this covered all of them. They do that once a year. Blood sacrifice. All to be obedient to the teachings of the law. And then comes Jesus. And Jesus comes and offers His life as a sacrifice for all mankind. Look, look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, and I'm, I'm going to read some verses. Uh, the first part of chapter 9 describes this old covenant, that temple that I was talking about, the holy place, and how only one, what's included in there. Verse 6 says, When these things prepared like this, the priest entered the first room repeatedly, to perform their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does that only once a year. And he never enters that place without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people that they had committed in ignorance. Verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They are physical regulations and only deal with food, drink, and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. Verse 11, But Christ has appeared, listen, as a high priest of the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands... He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And then listen to this. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those that are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through an eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will that cleanse our consciousness from dead works so that we can serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of the internal inheritance because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And then look at chapter 10 for just a minute. Since the law had only a, has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the reality itself of those things, it cannot perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices that they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, they wouldn't have stopped being offered, since the worshipers, worshipers purified once and for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in the sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible, listen, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And then he goes on and says this a little bit more down through there. But in verse 11, or verse 10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sin. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. 
Christ sacrifice is different from every other sacrifice you could you could picture in the scripture any other sacrifice that we might offer what is most important to us and what is of most value to us Jesus the lamb of God John describes him in his gospel as John the Baptist is speaking behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world he's described as that one he will make the ultimate sacrifice he will become the ultimate sacrifice. So think just a moment with me. What's the difference between those Old Testament sacrifices and the sacrifice that Christ made? For you and for me on that cross, what's different? What's the difference between His blood and the blood of animals that was offered for the forgiveness of sins? Three quick thoughts. His sacrifice was personal. He offered His life. His life. He shed His blood. He, he is our substitute Offering, He offered Himself His own blood. When He died on that cross, He gave up His life, His blood for you, for me, and for the world. Folks, there is no greater picture in all of Scripture of love and obedience than Christ on the cross. There's not. He, he obeyed, he, he followed God's will and purpose for his life as the Son of God. He shed his blood. He pictured his love for mankind. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we have come to know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought also to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, it goes on to say. His demonstration of love, His sacrifice was personal. We just sang a song, Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Jesus paid the price. It was a personal sacrifice. But it was also a powerful sacrifice. The Scripture teaches us, Acts chapter 20, his blood purchased us. His sacrifice, it, it purchased us. His blood redeemed us in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 and Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. His blood has the power to sanctify. His blood, his sacrifice of his blood provided eternal life in Hebrews chapter 13. His blood doesn't just cover sins, it cleanses us from our sins. The Scripture describes the power of His sacrifice as one that would make us now fully white, as pure as snow. It makes us as if, listen, as if we had never sinned. That's, that's what happens to us when we take this sacrifice as our own. It says He wipes our sins away and He makes it as if we had never sinned. We have been justified. This, this sacrifice is powerful. It washes away, it cleanses all our sin. There is power in the blood of Christ. The cross makes all the difference for you and me. His sacrifice was personal. His sacrifice was powerful. His sacrifice was permanent. Three or four times in this passage, the writer of Hebrews says, this sacrifice was once and for all. A once and for all sacrifice. <coughs> you know what that means? There's no other sacrifice that will ever be needed for the forgiveness of sin. 
from the, from the moment that Jesus died on the cross and shed His blood for you and me, there is never, ever, ever a need for a blood sacrifice again. The new covenant that He's talking about here comes into play. It paved the, the old covenant paved the way for Christ to come and to cover all of that with His blood. It is a permanent sacrifice. You know what that means? His sacrifice was sufficient for you. His sacrifice was sufficient for your best friend and your worst enemy. His sacrifice was sufficient for all sin, past, present, and future. By being permanent means it never has to be repeated. Christ, nor anyone, would ever have to pay the price for the sins of the world again. It doesn't have to be repeated, but dear friend, it does have to be accepted. You have to accept His sacrifice as your own. Receive it. His sacrifice gives us eternal life. It gives us an eternal home in heaven if we'll accept it. When you think about what Christ went through this week, when you reflect on the fact that He made a triumphal entry, not because He wanted it to be triumphal, the people made it that way. He came into town as He walked down those streets, as He made His way to Golgotha, as He suffered on that cross, as He sacrificed His life for you. Remember, it was a personal sacrifice. It was powerful. And it was permanent. But you and I must receive it as our own. So if you haven't, would you? If you know somebody that hasn't, why don't you go share it with them? Go share the good news. Because His sacrifice is something that needs to be proclaimed. And that's the job of you and I, His followers. Those that have been cleansed by the powerful blood of Jesus. Those who have received His sacrifice as our own. To make us in right standing with God so that we can have hope and forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven. He spoke of it in this passage. There's an eternal inheritance that is there for us. His once and for all sacrifice demands a response. And so if you're here today and you've never responded to Christ's offer of forgiveness to you through His sacrifice of His blood on the cross, why not today? Why not respond to Him today and say, I seek your forgiveness. I ask for you to forgive me. I ask you to be my Savior. I repent of my sins. I tell you that I'm sorry and that I don't want to live the way I'm living anymore. I want you as my guide. And when you do that, you receive permanent, once and for all, forgiveness for your sins. And eternal life with Him. And if you've already made that decision and you know that Christ is your Savior and you know that your eternal home is with Him in heaven, then let's join our voices together and let's go proclaim to those around us the hope that Jesus offers. The power of the cross. The power of His sacrifice. The fact that it is enough for everyone. But they must choose to accept it as their own. And then make sure, not only be the voice and telling others, but make sure others can see that His sacrifice, that His shed blood has made a difference in you. Make sure it's visible in the way that we live. So who are you today? I want you to stand with me.
Are you the lost person? The one that's been relying on parents to do what they do, or this person to do what they do, or somebody to put a blessing over me to make it all right for me? You've been relying on all those other sources? Hey, they don't provide lasting things for you. But Christ shed His life so that you could have eternal life. Would you come and receive Him today? And if you have, and you know that, who are you going to share the good news with? Who are you going to invite to come hear the good news? And is your life a reflection that the blood of Jesus has made a difference in your life? Use these moments. Respond. As we sing, I hear the Savior sing.